Welcome to the Game Dev Pantry, a series where we retro-engineer interesting mechanics in the Unreal Engine. Character controllers are a very important aspect of video games. In many cases, this feature can make or break a title, depending on the genre. And it makes sense. If a character controller is bad or feels clunky, getting from point A to point B can risk becoming tedious for the player much faster. On the other end of the spectrum, a good controller can not only make traveling a more interesting experience, it can make traveling be the fun of the game. This is especially important in 2D platformers, where most of the fun will be tied to challenges and puzzles which involves the character controller. Over the years, there have been many titles which have defined what a good character controller can feel like. Today in the pantry, we will hack open and reverse engineer one of the sharpest, most responsive, most expressive and smooth character controllers. The one from Hollow Knight. This indie smash hit is now acclaimed as one of the best metroidvanias, both in terms of gameplay and art direction. And this is in part due to how effortlessly the player character handles. It's important to know that there are many things that contribute to the feel of the controller in Hollow Knight. There is the basic control scheme, the camera, the power-ups, and how all of this interacts with one another. This episode will focus solely on the basic control scheme, with future episodes that will expand by exploring cameras and such. So without further ado, let's get cooking. But before we start opening the engine, let's take a deeper look at how Hollow Knight makes its character feel nice to control. For basic left and right movement, we can see that the walk of the knight is almost instant, with no acceleration or analog controls. Same for turning around. While the animation takes a few frames, the model changes velocity instantly in the other direction. This instantaneousness of movement makes the character feel extremely responsive. If you release the input, the character stops, and if you press an input, the character responds. While usually instant acceleration feels a bit awkward on a character controller, Hollow Knight masks this very well with good animations and camera movement. Notice how the knight's head bobs forward when you initiate a movement, or how the cloak keeps its momentum when you stop. As for speed, the knight takes a bit under 2 seconds to cross half of the screen. This is relatively slow if we compare it to Celeste or Super Meat Boy, which features movement speed about twice as fast or more. This slower pace allows for many things. The first one is that it makes precision platforming easier to execute. If the character is slower, it makes it easier to not mess up a jump from the edge of a platform, for example. The slowness allows also for a more dense platforming puzzles, since more can be fitted in a single screen. And it also helps give a sense of scale. Everything seems a lot bigger and more impressive when you can't cross it normally in an instant. But the most important thing is that it gives room for more power-ups that enhances movement. By keeping the character slow, it makes power-up like the dash, the double jump, or the super dash much more meaningful because while they are fast relative to the original speed, they are still reasonably contained within the screen. In contrast, a game like Super Metroid has a character that can by default run incredibly fast and jump very high. And it also features power-ups that enhances movement like the speed boost or the space jump. However, in both cases, the places that these power-ups unlock are often hidden, convoluted, or awkward to reach because your character has to move across several screens worth of space to actually make use of these power-ups. In other words, the relative slowness of the knight is a very clever design choice and works really well for the character controller. Now that we have something we can start with, let us open the engine. For this one, we'll start with an empty project, as we will be creating our own pawn movement once again. We want to have a lot of control over how the character handles its movement, and we do not want to deal with physics at all. We'll start by creating a pawn actor for our knight. And we'll also build a small gym to test the movements we're about to code. In the pawn, we'll begin by replacing the default route by a capsule collider and adding a camera. We'll adjust the distance of the camera and the dimensions of the capsule to have it close to what it's like in the game. Next, we need to set up the basic movement aspect of the knight. We will create a function that can generate movement input, add velocity, and a function that creates the movement of all added velocity at the end of the frame, resolve movement. Add velocity is simple, 
We'll simply create a vector for direction and a float for scale that we will multiply together and add to an added velocity vector variable. Resolve movement is a bit more complex, as we need the function to perform multiple things. But let's start simple. We want it to consume the added velocity into movement. So we'll take that velocity, multiply it by the frame time, and use a set actor location to move our capsule. We also want our capsule to not just stop when it hits a slant, we still want it to move. To do this, we need to save the sweep result of our set actor location into a local variable. We will then perform another set actor location, but this time, we will make sure that the direction of the set actor location is parallel to the surface. To do that, we will take the displacement vector, which is the trace end minus the trace start of our sweep variable, and perform a dock product with the impact normal, which we will then multiply by the impact normal. Then, we subtract this new vector from the displacement vector. This bit of math gives us the displacement we need, so we add this to the actor location. To make sure that our set actor location can handle multiple surface, we'll set this last bit of code in a while loop, with the condition being a blocking hit from our sweep result. Now, we have a capsule that can move, and that always accelerates, even when hitting a wall. The problem we have is that the added velocity can keep increasing regardless of our actual movement. To remedy that, we will want to separate the current velocity and the added velocity. So we'll create a new vector that's just called velocity. This is a vector that will be set at the end of the resolve movement to calculate how much the knight actually moved in this frame and to what speed that corresponds to. To do this calculation, we will create a local vector that is equal to the knight's location at the beginning of the function. We use this at the end of the function to calculate the character's actual velocity. After that, we also need to set the added velocity variable to zero at the end to stop the character from endlessly accelerating. And finally, back at our set actor location, we need to make sure that the displacement is now made up of velocity and the added velocity, not just the added velocity. Now the next thing we want to do is put a cap on the speed that our character can have. And we want that cap to be different horizontally and vertically, as we'll be making a jump and gravity at some point. For that, we'll break our velocity plus added velocity vector into its component and clamp each of them before scaling them by the frame time. The Y component will be clamped by max walk speed, and we'll come back for the Z component later when we do the jump. The final thing we need this function to do is to make our change in direction sharp for the Y axis, the walking. This means that no matter what our acceleration or speed is, if we do not input anything, or input in the other direction, the character instantly adjusts. For this, we simply need to check if the added velocity has the same sign, plus or minus, as our current velocity. If it is the case, then nothing changes. And if the sign is different, then we ignore the current velocity and only follow the added velocity. With the function finally complete, it's time to create the inputs. We'll use the standard inputs that Hollow Knight uses for the demonstration, but feel free to set them up as you prefer. Personally, I'm not a fan of jumping with the Z key. Once the inputs are done, we'll bind the sign of the axis value of our left-right input to our add velocity function. Since we want instant acceleration, we'll multiply this number by a high value. Don't forget to set the vector input to 0, 1, 0 for our add velocity to work in the Y axis. As for the speed, we'll set it to a bit over a quarter of the screen's length to mimic Hollow Knight's speed. With the basic movement component completed and the walk done, let's take a closer look at Hollow Knight's vertical movement. This is one of the game's most well-crafted character movement options. The first thing that is apparent is how expressive the jump is. It is possible to do anything from a gentle hop, a short skip, a moderate jump, or a big leap all depending on how long you hold the jump button. This, combined with a generous airtime and a moderate fall speed, allows for some precise but fast-paced platforming. In more technical terms, the rise of the jump is fast. It takes about 15 frames over 60 to cover most of the height. Since the airtime is quite long, it takes a bit more time to reach the apex and start falling, about another 10 to 20 frames. And then, 
the character falls in a bit more than 15 frames. This makes the full length of the jump about one second. For shorter jumps, the air time is reduced to make the jump feel sharper. The game assumes that if the player releases the jump button, he wants to fall, and he wants to fall fast. Back in the engine, before we start playing with the jump, we need to add gravity and movement states to differentiate between when the player is jumping, rising, falling, or grounded. We'll make an enum to keep track of the movement mode, and create a function to manage its changes. The reason we do the function is to make sure that certain movement modes have priority over others. The player shouldn't start the falling movement while jumping, for example. We'll set the conditions as we create the functions. For the gravity function, we'll simply call it every frame before the resolve movement gets called. The function will add velocity towards the negative z-axis. The scale will depend on the movement mode, so we'll use a select node. When falling or grounded, we want the regular force to apply. The reason we want a force to apply when grounded is to make sure the character starts falling the moment he leaves ground. When jumping, we don't want any gravity to apply to give us more direct control over the acceleration of the jump. When rising, which means after the jump is finished but before the apex is reached, we want a gravity value that is lower than the regular to maximize the airtime of the jump. For now, we'll just create variables for each of those and set them later. Keep in mind, these values are for acceleration and not maximum speed. For the maximum fall speed, we will have to go in the resolve movement function and create a variable for our max fall speed. This variable will plug it in the minimum clamp for our z axis. Now, Hollow Knight's fall speed is about 1.5 screen per second and never goes higher. While it feels fast, this speed still allows the player to react to what's below them. Onto the jump itself. We'll need three functions one that starts the jump one that does the jumping, which will bind to the event tick, and one that stops the jump. We'll also need a few variables for the jump. A speed cap, a jump acceleration, a timer, and a max duration. And while we're at it, we should organize all of this, or it might become a bit of a mess later. So we'll create categories such as jump, movement, and gravity for our variables and functions. For the jumping function, We'll simply check if the movement mode is currently jumping, and if it is the case, add velocity towards the positive z-axis. We want the character to reach its max jump very quickly, so we'll set the scale using the acceleration variable, and we'll set that variable to a very large number. We also need to increment the jump timer. And once the timer reaches the jump duration, we set the timer back to zero and trigger the stop jump function. For the start jump, it will check if the player is grounded, and if that is the case, change the movement mode to jumping. The stop jump will set the movement mode to rising. We'll also create a boolean input for the stop jump to sometimes make it sharp. A sharp stops jump, in addition to changing the movement mode, will also remove some of the upward velocity to make the stop more sudden. This will be used when the player releases the jump button earlier. Let's add the jump's maximum speed to our resolve movement. And while we're at it, we also need the function to switch from rising to falling when the apex is reached. For that, we'll check if the knight is either jumping or rising, and if that's the case, if the velocity in z has reached the negatives or zero. If that's the case, we'll change the movement mode to falling. The apex will have been reached. Now that we've plugged all our variables, it is time to attribute values to them. The jump max speed is about 1 screen per second and lasts for 14 frames. The time between the end of the jump and reaching the apex on a full jump is about 1 third of a second. So we'll make the rising gravity 3 times the max speed of the jump, and we'll make the regular gravity acceleration 3 times the max speed of the fall speed. Now let's bind that to inputs. On pressed, it starts jump, and if it is released too early, it stops jump sharply. Now there's a problem. We still can't jump. 
Of course, we forgot to create a function that detects if we're grounded. The game still thinks we're falling. So let's fire a function on component hit for the capsule. To check if the impact was with something relatively horizontal, something groundy. We'll make sure the dot product between the hit impact normal and 0, 0, 001, 1 in the z-axis, is at least higher than 1 over root 2, which is about 0.71. If that is the case, we'll set the movement mode to grounded and set a timer for a second function called ungrounded. This function will check if we're not rising, jumping, or already falling, and if those conditions are met, set us to falling. Since every frame that we are touching something, it fires a uncomponent hit, as long as we're touching the ground, the ungrounded function will set its timer for the next frame, while if we stop touching the ground, the ungrounded function will fire. While we're at it, we'll make a pure function that tells us if the knight is in the air. A pure function is simply a function that technically doesn't modify variables. It is useful to quickly get information without having to use execution lines. In our case, the knight is in the air if he's jumping, rising, or falling. So once that's done, we can replace the conditions for ungrounded by our not in air function. With this, we should have a jump that's relatively similar to that of Hollow Knight. We can even test it with some platforms to check how accurate it is. Let's just make a simple layout. So there we have it. This is a good start for a character controller. It handles well, has an expressive jump, and the way it was coded will allow us to scale it with new methods of movement. While we're done for this episode of Game Dev Pantry, we're not done with Hollow Knight. In the next part, we'll tackle adding sprites and animation to our character. So thank you for joining us today. If you liked the video, please consider sharing and giving us a thumbs up. We welcome to any feedback in the comments below. And don't forget that you can grab the project following the link in the description. Have a good one.